Welcome everyone to the 2023 Global Animal Disaster Management Conference, brought to you in partnership with Animal Evac New Zealand and our platinum sponsor, Four Paws International. Before we start, we have a few basic housekeeping items. We want to bring to your attention, there was an error on the original conference schedule. The times, the Australian times for the New York sessions, F and H, were incorrect. Please visit our website at www.gadmc.org to view the updated and correct schedule. The Zoom chat feature has been disabled, so if you have any questions, we encourage you to use the Q&A box. This year, we have enabled multilingual closed captioning, so if you would like to hear the presentation in another language, please click on the closed caption icon at the bottom of the Zoom screen. We encourage you to use the hashtag GADMCONF in your posts about the conference on social media to help spread the word. A short evaluation will be made available as you exit this presentation. Your feedback is valuable to us and will help to shape the next GADMAC conference. Finally, a reminder that the video recording of this and all other presentations will be available later this year after it has been properly edited. It is our privilege to welcome our next two speakers. Dr. Jimmy Tickle is a veterinarian at the Institute for Infectious Animal Diseases at Texas A&M University and an internationally recognized emergency management expert. Dr. Ann McCann retired from a long career with the U.S. Department of Agriculture, APHIS, Animal and Plant Health Inspection Services, and now consults with disaster response NGOs. Together, they are with us today to provide an introduction to the National Alliance of State Animal and Agricultural Emergency Programs, NASIP, and the National Animal Rescue and Sheltering Coalition, NARSC. Ann and Jimmy, thank you. Thank you. It's great to be with you. And, and Ann and I have a lot to share. Uh, we are friends and colleagues that have known each other for a lot of years, presented, uh, co-presented, and so it's an honor to be with her, honor to have followed Ian and uh, his background. He kind of gave you an international perspective. We're going to give you a U.S. perspective, and one of the things that uh, I've found is I've begun to work a, a bit more internationally is you always want to know the playing field. As you go into a country, understand who are the movers and the shakers uh, those people that uh, get things done, those people that affect policy uh, and, and can bring about uh, uh, funding and those uh, resources. So what we want to do with sharing this presentation about NASAP and NARSC are to show how two partners, NGOs and then state animal health uh, emergency programs personnel in the form of NASAP can work together to work the playing field to advantage rather than to competition and disharmony. So this slide shows you uh, most of the players uh, on, the on the national and state level when we start to get into U.S. animal response. On the left, you have USDA, NASDA, which actually houses the National Assembly of State Animal Health Officials, state veterinarians, if you're familiar with the U.S., who lead on behalf of the 50 states animal response in those particular jurisdictions. They affect regulatory um, and policy decisions. So that's where a lot of that emanates from. As we move to the right or the center of the slide, we start to see NACIP and NARSC, those two partner together. I'll go back to them, but before I uh, actually delve into them as deeply, I did want to explain uh, kind of discuss what happens with the AVMA and USAJ. Those are examples. AVMA, we actually have Dr. Warren Hess on with us now. Um, uh, those, that organization represents the veterinarians across the, 
the, the nation. USHA does it in a little bit different format as well. Uh, both of those organizations have committees that relate to animal emergency response. When we look to the right of the screen, it gets even more interesting in the fact that numbers of states in the U.S. have banded together. You can see SADRA being the southeastern state, the multi-state being the lighter blue in the center uh, northern part of the, of the country, and then you see the New England states being the top corner of the northeastern part of the country. Uh, groups of states have gathered together to form their own groups and address different issues. The value of NASEP and NARSC and their partnership is, is that rather than compete with any of these organizations, they actually work together to enhance each opportunity that these different groups present to promote animal response in the U.S., whether it be trying to affect policy or, or regulatory advancement, working with USDA and Assembly of State Animal Health Officials, which these state veterinarians, some of them actually belong to NACEP and some of them are on the board of NACEP. Uh, in the same way, the partners on the right that belong to the regional groups are actually emergency management programs uh, that deal with animal response that work on behalf of their states. Some of those are members of NASEP. And so when we start to get to this, I'll show you how, and you'll find it too probably in your country uh, or your jurisdiction, is that you start to see the same people showing up in lots of different organizations. For example, Dr. Warren Hess that I mentioned before, who works now for AVMA, also worked as a state animal health official for the state of Utah and was a past president of NASA. And McCann, who will be your next speaker, has worked for USDA. She has also worked in uh, NASEP and now works for NARSC. Uh, I myself have worked in SADRA for the state of North Carolina and am now a board member of NASEP and also work for a university. So one of the things that we have to understand is that we're all a part of the same team and we may wear different hats. So rather than leverage competition and disharmony, how can we work together? One of the ways that NASEP does that is that it partners strongly with NARS, the NGO side of animal response for the U.S., and it has voting members from all 50 states that are elected or nominated by their state veterinarians or state animal health officials. So it gives a collective voice to every one of the groups that you see here in a manner that can affect regulatory and policy, as well as funding, legislature, political pool, all the things that we need to promote animal response. Okay, and let's go forward. We'll pick up speed now because you kind of get the playing field. So what does NASEP do? Well, what it really tries to do is give a collaborative alliance of these state government players that are involved in animal response. And these are these emergency programs personnel, usually housed under the departments of agriculture at the state level. And one of the things that we always try to do is that we try to uh, act as a voice nationally for those state players and advance that voice forward. So for example, our FEMA, our Federal Emergency Management uh, Agency, as well as to USDA, where a lot of our funding comes. One of the most important things that we have to remember is that capacity and capability will always be shorter than what we'd like. So being able to share resources, we have an emergency management compact that states share resources, including animal response resources. So one of the things that NASEP tries to do is to get a standardized response, standardized approach, standardized language, so that states can share resources between one another. And there's that collective voice. And even that voice trying to uh, ask for funding that will not only help individual states, 
but also national level sharing of resources. Next. And, and you know, and we've seen this and and you'll talk about it in some of the similar ways for NARS, and that is that we want to always promote communication, networking, information sharing, best practices, and to span the different levels, local, state, and federal. Members of NACEP are at all three of those levels, and those partnerships exist such that we can do all three of those functions. The thing that we always focus on in NASEP, even as a national organization, is to uh, to build local capacity and capability. Since all disasters begin and end locally, you can see some of the relationships that we uh, really foster and, and expand. And uh, Anne will talk more about that special relationship between NASEP and NARSC as we go forward. Next. We do have, um, and when we say member benefits, what we're actually talking about, remember, these are the state emergency management representatives uh, and then even local folks that have joined NASEP. What we're actually trying to do is in the way of providing them benefits or to provide opportunities to educate, to share knowledge, but even also to give them a voice to share what they are learning and what they're experiencing. And so our monthly calls actually gives us an opportunity to let them showcase their expertise and also to uh, bring uh, expertise that they may not have to the mic and let them learn and experience it from others' eyes as well. Next. So we have our monthly calls, but the thing that really hits the nail on the head is our summits. We have those every two years. Uh, we have one planned uh, in, in the planning for two, uh, 2024. Uh, it, it will be in Maryland. It actually moves from different states and different locations uh, in each iteration so that locals can have a chance to go and uh, that we can share the wealth of, of hosting uh, one of these summits. Uh, one of the things that we try to do there is uh, – allow as much networking so the meetings at, at dinner time, the meetings in the hallways, the, the partnerships that form uh, and, and the expertise that can be shared is, is really a second to none experience uh, because you've brought the movers and shakers from all 50 states into one location, put them in the same room, and a lot of good things happen when you do that. Next. Uh, you can see, if you say, well, how do you organize your summits? There are multi-day conferences. They have multiple tracks so that you can choose and pick and try to go to those that best benefit uh, your learning experience, your sharing experience. They're funded uh, oftentimes uh, through USDA or other federal entities. FEMA has participated. We have uh, gotten that uh, private companies as vendors will attend and, and also support and then NARSC and other non-governmentals uh, have really uh, supplied an awful lot of important funding as well. The board of directors actually raised the funding to put these summits on. And then you can see some of the uh, uh, additional meetings. And, and so, you know, remember when we talked about not competing? We actually invite the other regional groups and NGOs to hold meetings at the summit on either end of it, and then that really helps to to submit some of that partnership, resource sharing, and uh, and standardization of what we're trying to do with the national vision. Next, and then just a quick look. If you're saying, well, what's some of the things that you're doing? Your latest efforts. We're updating best practice working group uh, documents, and you can see that these are, again, the members of NARS, the members of the regional groups uh, representing the states, all participate in these working groups uh, as a part of NASAP, and then put out these best practices. We're starting to have the opportunity to support legislation and to push policy, uh, develop stronger partnership with DHS is something that's been on our plate and, and we've pushed forward and then are planning for our next summit. So one of the quick things, and go to your next slide, uh, Ann, and I'll turn it over to you, and that is, you know, 
Ian was just talking about climate change. And so if you were wonder if if we got into it very quickly, NASEP and what would it role be in climate change? It would be to put the responders to give them a voice for what we need to do on behalf of response to climate change, while policymakers, uh, Congress people and such as that try to deal with the prevention and mitigation. So you can understand well, that's a great thing that NASEP can do is actually give voice to those that would develop response to those impacts that we're currently seeing from climate change. So that's a, that's a way that uh, I could offer that up. So Anne, why don't you take it forward? Okay, thanks, Jimmy. Um, so, so real quick, Ann, just before you get started, Jimmy, sure. we did have we did have a question. Are the best practice working groups documents publicly available anywhere? Yes, they are. They are on the website. So we uh, NASAP has its website, uh, and uh, those documents are shared. Uh, they they are uh, uh, shared with everyone that would would like to see them. Uh, again, it has U.S. slant to it, but uh, I think it is a, a very worthwhile in, in looking at, especially for for jurisdictions that are trying to to expand some you know capability and capacity in those specific areas. Wonderful, thank you. And Anne, I apologize for interrupting. Please continue. No worries. I would just add to what Jimmy said that the current versions of the documents are in the final editing now, and um, the contractor who is assembling all of that and running it through the final technical writing expects to have them published, I believe, this fall in the next month or so, maybe two months. Um, so look for them uh, on the NASEP website, and we'll show you that at the end. Um, Additionally, uh, and we'll talk about this a little bit, uh, the Zoo uh, and Aquarium's All Hazards Partnership has best practice materials for uh, organizations that are you know, maintain collections of animals like zoos, aquariums, and private collectors um, uh, on their website. So uh, that would be zap, Z-A-H-P dot org. So there, there are a number of best practice documents available or soon to be available. All right, uh, kicking off with NARSC. NARSC is the National Animal Rescue and Sheltering Coalition, and it was born in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. It currently uh, contains 14 organizations. Um, all of these organizations are national in scope and reach and all have the capability and capacity to support emergency preparedness, response and recovery for animals. Um, in terms of capability, there are kind of three main buckets among the NARSC agencies. Some organizations actually have deployable responders, some are funding organizations, and some actually are associations of animal professionals. And um, some or some of the organizations actually do multiples of those three, uh, but those are the three main buckets for NARSC. Um, and then in terms of NARSC, I'm going to run through this um, pretty quickly. Um, NARSC internally, uh, the organizations with, within NARSC adhere to a, a code of conduct that says we will be NIMS compliant. We will comply with the National Incident Management System. Uh, we will not self-deploy. There are a whole uh, list of things that NARSC agreed to in the aftermath of Katrina um, to make partnering with the non-governmental community attractive to states. Part of what we committed to is we will play within the emergency management system. We will not self-deploy. We will not come in and try to take over the, the state's uh, response. Instead, we will assimilate into the state's response and perform those activities that they've asked us uh, and requested that we deploy in to do. Um, additionally, the NARSC members agree to attend regular meetings. Um, we commit to training collectively. And one of the things that NARSC very early on did was to establish some baseline um, uh, uh, qualifications that all of the organizations would train to um, so that 
any training that you get from NARSC in sheltering, uh, whether you get it from the ASPCA or American Humane or uh, Red Rover or any of the other NARSC agencies, it will contain these basic core competencies that we think are essential for sheltering. And likewise with any of the other disciplines related to animal response. Um, additionally, we agree to share lessons learned uh, after we all respond and we agree to communicate with each other and share situational awareness during disasters themselves. And then what does NARSC offer in terms of what do we give to our partners? We have agreed to be a, a planning partner with the federal government, uh, with FEMA, with USDA, with Department of Homeland Security, and frankly, with any of the other myriad federal agencies in the United States who have some um, authority or, or interest in animal uh, disaster response. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we are fully integrated into the emergency management system and we have all committed to being NIMS compliant. Um, we, are, uh, we provide liaisons uh, and subject matter expertise to states and local jurisdictions in their planning. Uh, we provide training uh, to those jurisdictions so that they can train their employees and their volunteers and whomever makes up their, their local animal uh, response capability. Um, and as we all know, in many places, there is no government capability. It's largely made up of a coordinated effort of the veterinary community, the animal um, uh, welfare community, and other interested people who are come together to, to build a capability within the jurisdiction to meet the needs of animals and address animal issues and disaster. And then we serve as, um, as Jimmy said, best practice working group co-chairs, as well as um, uh, facilitators to accomplish different projects and, and, uh, and, and, work assignments, uh, developing training and things like that um, to meet the needs of uh, particular focus areas in animal emergency management that are a priority for government. Um, so we're, we're really there to be the animal experts to our community partners. So who are NARSC's clients? NARSC actually will only develop uh, memorandums of understanding with states, uh, territories, and tribal nations within the United States. Um, it, it, uh, NARSC is not a responder to the local level. All NARSC activations occur at the state, uh, territory, or tribal level into support whatever jurisdiction we're requested to help with. Um, additionally, um, NARSC individual organizations can establish memorandums of, of understanding with local jurisdictions, county jurisdictions, whatever um, sub-state level of organization exists within a state, uh, they can establish their own MOUs with those jurisdictional levels or with entities within those jurisdictional levels. So a national NARSC member may set up an MOU directly with a local animal welfare agency or, um, or with a county or you know, any jurisdictional level or entity within that uh, state or territory or tribe that has a responsibility within their jurisdiction for animal response. NARS can be requested, or NARS member agencies can be requested to go in and support um, at that level by those entities directly. Now, whenever that happens, NARS agencies will alert the state to let them know that they've been requested to go in at the behest of whatever organization or local government has asked them to come in. So um, we try to be transparent about it, um, but the individual NARSC agencies may have MOUs at sub-state levels. NARSC itself will only have an MOU at the state, tribe, or territory level. 
So what's the benefit of all this collaboration? Why do we do this? Um, when, when NARSC and NACEP were first created, um, there wasn't a common um, uh, ability for everybody to work together. In fact, um, not all the NARSC agencies had trust between them. They operated differently in their strategies and, and levels of interest in engaging on other than disaster issues were sometimes very different. Um, so between the NARSC agencies and then between NARSC and government, there was a need to build a rapport, open that communication channel, begin to agree to work on this disaster space and try to uh, enhance national capability and capacity for preparedness response and recovery. Why was that important? Down to even the most basic things in Hurricane Katrina back in 2005, when multiple um, non-governmental organizations went in to support uh, some of the response efforts uh, in the areas affected by Hurricane Katrina, and they didn't even have common forms to be able to go in and work together to perform even animal sheltering and some of the most basic animal response activities. So the collaboration was born out of the pain that came from Hurricane Katrina back in 2005. Um, and it really started with relationship building. How do we begin to engage together? How do we agree to put aside other differences in philosophies and approaches to say, in, these, in this disaster space, we can all work together and we can work together as the federal government, as state, local, tribal, and territorial animal emergency managers, and as the leading national professional animal organizations in the United States to come together and solve problems and um, enhance preparedness and, and build capacity and sustain capacity for uh, response and recovery. Um, from that, uh, one of the things we learned as we all started working together and talking together is that we were sort of shooting ourselves in the foot previous to us all partnering together by individually commenting anytime we were asked to on different emergency management policies and um, doctrine and things that we had the opportunity to weigh in on when everybody came in with slightly different ways of thinking about something or uh, offering slightly different feedback, sometimes wildly divergent feedback. The, the thing that happened was we were self-selecting ourselves out of consideration. So um, what we really learned to do is to take the opportunity to self-adjudicate our comments, our input, um, and our feedback when we're asked for it to collectively reach consensus among ourselves and to speak with one voice back to government so that there is a consistent approach to animal response in the country. And that only comes from us having this collaboration, this coalition to bring us together and to actually talk about um, how, how does this organization and this organization, each one of the 14 organizations in NARSC feel about any particular thing that comes before us related to animal emergency management? And how can we reach consensus on that and then speak with one voice back to our, our government partners? And what that has then led to is the increased ability for all of us collectively, government and, and non-government uh, animal professionals alike, to sit down and actually take a strategic look at how we, we operate in, within the animal emergency management space in this country to identify um, uh, gaps, issues, um, and unmet needs in the national capabilities and, and national preparedness? And then how do we take that and develop focus areas so that we can actually move the bar forward on a national scale to have national, you know, conversations 
largely through the NACEP summit, through NACEP calls, and through other avenues of communication that we've created since these partnerships evolved in, in the aftermath of Katrina to actually build and enhance the, the capabilities that we have in this country. And it's led to some real successes. Um, one of the things that we started with was actually trying to norm national strategies for pet and animal emergency management. Now, anybody that's been looking at uh, what has been going on in the United States uh, over the, since Katrina knows that when we first started this effort, it was really largely related to pets and service animals. And what has evolved in the 15 or so years since then is an expansion of that to all animals. Um, and that reflect that is now reflected in the national preparedness goal and the national response framework, which uh, puts it out as FEMA doctrine to the emergency management community um, to to address and and consider the needs of animals and their owners in planning for emergency response. Um, and then, as we've already alluded to, the best practices in animal emergency management. Um, evolved in the aftermath of Katrina again, uh, when there really wasn't uh, peer-reviewed guidance that that was developed by the you know those that are considered the national subject matter experts in each of these subject areas. Um, you saw that there were eight uh, different areas that that have been considered for um, best practices, and those best practice working groups were convened by NARSC and NASEP with funding from USDA to actually bring the national subject matter experts in each of those eight topic areas together and, um, and evolve these, these best practice documents, which then go out for a period of peer review and comment, and then come back and, and finally get published. Um, there, this is We're now going through the third iteration to update those best practices. And as I mentioned, they will be available later this year. Um, the second area that evolved um, from the lessons learned from Katrina and the um, ensuing disasters that happened as we all were talking more collectively about what happens in each of the subsequent responses, we realized we needed to expand from household pets and service animals to a larger discussion of all hazards, all species emergency management. Um, part of uh, the USDA office that I worked in um, is, uh, I worked with, within APHIS, but for the animal care area, um, and part of what they do is they regulate animals can, uh, under the Animal Welfare Act, uh, and that includes zoos, aquariums, and laboratories. And those animals that are in collections like that have unique needs in disasters, whether they be foreign animal disease, um, the approach to agriculture animals in a foreign animal disease is different than the approach you can take with zoo collections and other, um, other uh, captive wildlife uh, uh, populations that are susceptible to the same diseases as the agriculture animals. So um, working with our colleagues in veterinary services, we were able to actually formulate some different um, approaches to those types of animals in foreign animal diseases, but also in natural uh, disasters. Those animals are equally affected um, in those disasters as well. Um, and animals in aquariums and laboratories and all of these uh, collections need to have specialized care and uh, attention that is different than um, how you would treat agriculture animals or pets, service animals, or other species or other types of animals. Um, same thing with agriculture animals. In the United States, um, agriculture is, is big business or you know, smaller business, but business. And so um, the assistance that FEMA can provide to those animals in uh, disaster response is limited. But collectively, we can all do more uh, or better together uh, to protect these animals in a disaster response um, 
if we're looking at their unique needs and how to meet those needs in disaster. Um, and then wildlife as well. Um, and I, I just think the bee story is an amazing story. I, um, in my USDA role, would respond to the National Response Coordination Center at FEMA headquarters. And one of the things that uh, came out of the 2017 hurricanes in Puerto Rico was uh, the reality that the tops of all the plants had been shredded off in these hurricanes and that there wasn't um, a way to sustain the bee population. And of course, bees pollinate uh, for agriculture and, and growing of, of many plants. And so um, uh, the request came up to us to provide bee food. Um, and so we actually met with uh, apiists, I'm not sure what the right term is, but we met with the bee people and said, what can bees eat when there isn't their normal plant source? Uh, for, for them to pollinate and sustain themselves. So they they told us what to get and we got it and we provided it. And that has actually manifested itself over and over again in hurricanes affecting mainland uh, US as well, um, because there's a recognition in some of these high wind events that we've had lately that um, we, we need to provide this uh, along with all kinds of different um, uh, things that we had heretofore not really considered as we looked into um, our response needs for just the pets and service animals. So um, the third area that I wanna talk about in terms of success is actually building capabilities and capacity for animal emergency management. And I just wanna highlight just a couple uh, things. So NARSC, in, as I mentioned earlier, in its initial formula, Form, forming um, actually um, started to identify core capabilities um, among the NARSC agencies that then led to training standards within NARSC. That then became the some of the groundwork that fed into, um, Jimmy mentioned SADRA earlier. SADRA is the Southeast US states and they were looking to develop some re resource typing document that would enable them to share resources among their states. And they asked NARS to take a look at that, that um, resource typing. And so those core capabilities and training standards meshed with what had been developed by SADRA and they became an initial SADRA resource typing toolkit, which then was endorsed by NASEP um, all before FEMA agreed to take on animal resource typing. So when FEMA finally came to all of us and said, we're ready to consider animal resource typing, that work had already been done because NASEP had taken the SADRA document and all the states of NASEP had agreed to accept the, the SADRA document and, and use that it, until FEMA created their resource typing, use that document as a guide to share resources among the, the 50 states and the territories and the tribal nations. So just that whole iteration of how what SADRA created and NARSC enhanced was endorsed by NASEP and became the, the um, foundation for FEMA's resource typing. Um, and that's how that progression all happened. Um, and then, you know, beyond that, NARSC provides uh, planning and training support with the uh, two local jurisdictions and states so that they can build their local response capabilities. Um, NARSC deploys into states and, and um, supports and augments the, the state and local capacity to meet response needs when uh, the state does not have those capabilities all within their borders. Um, NARSC can be requested in to deploy. And then NARSC also offers coordination calls during a response to provide real-time problem solving, situational awareness, and the ability to elevate significant unmet needs and uh, gaps related to animals so that those issues can, can be um, surfaced and addressed. And then the last piece of this is Actually, I think the overall goal that we're all looking for, and that is to really integrate uh, the animal 
and human response, because as we all know, humans and animals live together and coexist together within the, uh, the, the you know, it, it kind of the one health space that we all live in of animals, you know, humans, animals, environment. Um, so just a couple of examples of how all of what I've talked about thus far have really led to some nice integration that's happening now. One is um, the American Red Cross has now adopted co-located sheltering and um, to, even though it's not its stated national policy, has accepted cohabitational uh, sheltering, uh, co-located sheltering being where humans and animals are located in shelter near to each other so that the humans can actually be in, uh, a key part of their animal's care while in shelter. And then cohabitational sheltering is where the humans and the animals actually occupy the same space within the shelter and they're directly responsible for the care of their animals. And so to support this, Red Cross actually now has a national um, uh, pet person on, on board and, and she is implementing strategies uh, for them to go ahead and, and build this out so that they can uh, support humans and animals sheltering together uh, during disasters. This has been a long time coming. And um, for those of us who have been working on this for many years, it is, I well, in my opinion, one of the most significant moves forward in terms of actually changing the landscape of humans and animals uh, having the reasonable expectation that, that uh, or humans having the reasonable expectation that their animal needs are going to be met in disaster. Um, then I also wanna highlight uh, the USAR, ASAR, the urban search and rescue, the human side of search and rescue, and the animal search and rescue, uh, ASAR side of uh, response. Um, what we're seeing now, uh, which has been an evolution uh, over many years, is that um, the USAR teams, the human search and rescue teams, are recognizing that they need to build and train uh, to build their animal capabilities so that they can safely incorporate humans and animals in their rescue efforts. And they're seeing the animal search and rescue uh, responders as partners now because the animal search and rescue uh, folks have actually undergone much of the same training as the USAR folks. And they are equipped professional responders who are operating safely within whatever um, dangerous circumstance, be it uh, wildfires, be it um, uh, floodwaters, any of the areas where uh, search and rescue needs to happen, the ASAR folks have established training requirements and they're meeting those training requirements and uh, equipping the teams so that they can be seen as valuable partners. Uh, in response and, and, and they can do a coordinated integrated response depending on how the uh, jurisdiction sets up their, uh, their response organization. The last piece that I wanna touch on within this um, whole USAR ASAR piece is another um, aspect of the, the um, all hazards, all species uh, response that has grown up just in the last uh, year or two, and that is the um, formation of ZDR3, which is a group of uh, zoo professionals that came to realize uh, because of some disasters where uh, zoos were impacted that um, zoo professionals are a very specialized um, uh, 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 it's a very specialized industry and caring for captive wildlife um, is not uh, something that anybody who isn't trained to deal with those animals uh, should be doing. So ZDR3 came out of that need to um, build the, the capability within the zoo industry to help each other out when a disaster happens. So um, they can come in and, and support uh, animal evacuation. They can come in and support um, uh, assessments and figuring out both in the response and in the aftermath of the response, 
um, what it would take to get the the affected um, uh, zoo or aquarium or, or uh, captive wildlife uh, organization back up on its feet and running again. How to how to safely protect the animals in the midst of the disaster, um, protect the the um, business because many many zoos are actually um, either not for profit or for profit businesses. How do they protect the public within their their um, space when a, an incident happens within the uh, you know when they're open to the public? So they have to protect the animals and the people. And then how do they maintain the business, uh, particularly if they're going to be closed for any uh, point in time? How do they assess their needs and then get back on their feet again? So ZDR3 is, is something that has bor been born out of all of these conversations that we've had over time. And as we keep going, I'm sure we'll have more successes uh, to report to you in future years. But for now, these are some of the highlights of where we've been. And so, Jimmy, you want to take us home? And great job. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's one of those things that, uh, and I go back to that slide where we shared all of the different players and, and, and it's the team concept. One of the things that has, has been critical for NASEP and NARS to partner on is uh, is that team concept, the vision uh, that, uh, that, you know, better in animal health and, and uh, even owner uh, health uh, in, in disasters and disease uh, outbreaks uh, is, is the goal. The, the vision is, is, is that. It's not to compete with one another. It's not for glory. It's not for fame. It's to take care of animals and their owners. And that has allowed NARS, it's a fantastic thing that NARS partners actually have to compete for the same funding sources, you know, donations uh, from, uh, you know, the private sector. That's, they have to compete with one another, yet they have found a way to work with each other, partner together to better uh, the overall response on behalf of states, locals, uh, all the way down to uh, owners and their animals. So what a fantastic relationship and uh, the advancements have come because people keep their eyes on the prize and that would be that more animals survive, more animals are protected and uh, owners uh, can, can, um, can go through these impacts, uh, become more educated and prepare uh, on their own behalf and their animals' behalf to, uh, to, to make animal health a, a much, uh, put it in a much better place when we talk about these events. So now uh, let's turn it over. Uh, I don't know, we, we answered a question um, about the bees and uh, I, I think that's, and that's a new frontier for us. Uh, I loved it. Uh, I answered back that just as we uh, had zoo animals uh, you know, brought to us uh, as a, uh, uh, entity we needed to respond and plan better for. I know that states have uh, apiarists that uh, work with bees and and uh, actually uh, are involved in some of the emergency management preparedness and planning, but uh, an overall strategy and actually uh, working some of the uh, packages, even like mission ready packages that would, would be supplies and, and experts that could work with impacted bee populations in areas would be a fantastic uh, next step for us to work together through NASEP and NARSC and, and all of our partner stakeholders. Well, and, and the thing that I really like about that, um, Jimmy, is that we're actually looking beyond the animals themselves and looking on at those downstream impacts of us acting or not acting to uh, meet an immediate need that's put in front of us. And you know, what does it mean to the animals right in front of us, but what does it mean down the road? You know, what are we doing? What are we losing or what are we gaining by either taking action or not taking action to meet a particular animal need in a, in a disaster? You know, Ann, it goes back to what Ian said, and, and that is, is you have to have vision. Uh, you learn from what's currently uh, happening, and, and you talk about that after action, put all the experts in the room together, try to identify gaps and deficiencies, and then work towards those. But the thing that also has to come about is that vision for what 
will we look like in year uh, and go 15 years, 20 years, 25 years out? Where do we need to be? And that vision only comes when people are not competing with one another, but yet working as a team. And, and that's what uh, that's what's worked between NASIP and NARSC and bringing all the stakeholders uh, together, give them a voice, whether it's on a monthly call or at a summit, uh, training, uh, working groups to develop best practices. All of these are opportunities for vision and expertise to be shared and uh, and, and actually uh, taken to a, a much higher level rather than uh, in a comp- you know competition to, to to break things down. All right. I don't know if there's any questions, but we'll turn it back over to our host. And, and hey, we thank you for the opportunity. We don't have everything where we would like in, in the U.S., lots of things still to work on, and there always will be. But uh, we are proud of the people that work uh, day in, day out on behalf of Animal Response and, and look to partner together. I think that uh, you know, it's all about relationships. Uh, both in the event and pre-event as well, but uh, but I think that's the thing that uh, that really makes us hum. Oh my gosh, Ann and Jimmy, thank you so much, so much to think about, and you presented such an amazing overview of both organizations. Um, I believe we did have a question from Warren. If he'd like to hop on and ask, that would be great. If he great. Is still... So I, I get to ask him directly. So, uh, and Jimmy kind of alluded it, uh, to it, um, but, but I want to hear some specifics from him. So you've done a great job at describing what each organization has done or is doing, where do you see each organization or what accomplishments do you anticipate in the next 10 years? You know, Warren, I'm always surprised. Smart people uh, step in and, and, and apply and leverage that expertise in, in areas that, that, uh, that uh, can can not only meet the gap, but but actually uh, amaze you. And I'll just use your organization, Warren. So AVMA is, uh, for example, one of the things that was quite difficult for us to do is to start to develop uh, what what could we talk about in, with regard to training, and that when we issued certificates, when we had advancement of individuals in in areas that they they were becoming experts in we were not tracking that very well in the u.s it seemed that uh, it was tough to get together uh NASIP talked about it nars talked about it everybody did and then you know we we reached to you uh in avma to to start looking at a professional veterinary workforce for disaster and disease response, you stepped up to it. And there's, again, is another organization that steps into a gap as, as uh, co-members of uh, NARSC and NACEP. And, and then you bring uh, that, uh, that collective power, the, the fact that you represent nationally the veterinarians in the U.S. And so you were the logical uh, agency to step up or organization to step up and start to address how could we advance career ladders or training uh, programs in the lives and the experience of veterinarians such that they could uh, really leverage uh, the things that they were learning and being trained on to work anywhere in the U.S. and even internationally. So uh, I, I see more of that, Warren. I, I actually see that as we continue to partner that these agencies will continue to step into these particular gaps and fill them in the sense that they have the most logical and the most expedient way to not only take that gap uh, with regard to you know education or information, but even to uh, be able to push it politically to to uh, to arrange for funding and and then to again establish it as a standard across the nation. So uh, th- that's what I and I can't call the shots, but uh, man, you put smart people in the room together, and uh, from different agencies, and things like that actually happen. It's organic, and again, it's because they have their eye on the goal, and the goal is animal health. 
uh, instead of each other, uh, you know, and, and advancing an individual individual agenda. It, it's just been special that way. And and if I can just build on um, what you just said there, Jimmy, I I think um, what I see as kind of the the next emerging issues is I think we've done a, a really good job with um, the best practice working groups and with uh, the training and just uh, capacity building to really address boots on the ground response needs. And I think operational coordination, um, that EOC level support, emergency operations uh, uh, center level of support, I think is an area that we need to really focus on to help people uh, both educate the emergency management community on the animal issues um, and and needs in a disaster, and then how to how to go about bringing in um, the expertise to uh, facilitate that um, that uh, appropriate activity in the EOC uh, on behalf of animals if they don't have that intrinsic capability within their EOC. So I think that's an area uh, that I think we need to start to look at. Um, I think nationally, we're, we're still weak in catastrophic planning and preparedness. And, um, you know, we, we haven't had the really big one yet, um, but knock on wood, it, you know, we need to be prepared for it. And I think we need to continue to focus on enhancing capacity and, um, that leads me to my third area, and that is the whole concept of succession planning. Um, those of us that were around uh, in the period of Katrina are all getting older and um, retiring, and, and COVID brought a tremendous amount of turnover um, to the emergency management structure in the United States. And um, I think that and Jimmy and I were talking about this actually as we were putting this presentation together, we need to pay some attention to that and the fact that there weren't clear baton passes during COVID because one person left and somebody came at well after them. So there wasn't that sharing of information. So it's almost like we're starting again with some of these um, folks who are, have found themselves in, in key emergency management positions in government that really don't have um, the experience behind them uh, to draw upon all of what's gone on since Katrina. So we, we've got an uh, educational process, I think, there and, um, and a, a, a coaching and support process that we need to be thinking about. And then the last thing um, that we've talked about, but I think bears repeating in this, in this response uh, to Warren's question is, the whole concept of emerging emerging changes in the disaster sphere. How will disasters look different? And what do we need to do to, to plan for how animals will be impacted as climate change and other factors influence how disasters look and what we're all dealing with? So to me, those would be um, kind of the next 10 years. Yeah, and I think it's an opportunity for us to, to to, it, we've got to get a shout out to our uh, our first responder communities that we partner with, both uh, fire uh, and and we work uh, quite quite intimately. A lot of states do, and and we're we're doing it nationally as well. Working with with uh, our firefighters, we also work with emergency managers on the human side, uh, our uh, law enforcement. Uh, I think we're uh, developing that community team aspect there as well and in trying to integrate with them also to elevate and promote animal health as a support to human health. And then, of course, we will go into the environmental health and go one health. But uh, but especially that partnership, that human animal bond, uh, when we start to partner with uh, our other first responder communities, uh, I think that's what gives us a lot of resiliency and, and to start to look at uh, expanding our capabilities and capacities to meet the extremes that something like climate change brings, both, uh, you know, hot weather, cold weather, uh, severity of disasters and length of disaster seasons. All of those will require 
all of these response communities to partner together uh, and, and then, as you said, not only answer the success in questions, but even the longevity of response and uh, responder health. So those are those are key things that uh, I think we all need to partner together to, to look at and to solve. Oh, my gosh, so much you have left with us to consider and take back to our own communities, which is where it all needs to start. So I cannot, we all thank you so much for presenting and giving us a sense of what the United States is doing in terms of collaboration and managing response. So we have hit the end of our session, letter E today. We thank you so much for joining us. We could not have, have ended on a better note. We had wonderful speakers all session.